Open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're continuing our series in the book of Thessalonians. What an awesome thing to go through a book. And it's amazing, not only is God's Word intended for the audience of that day, however, it's also for us today as well. And so we are on a gospel journey. We have labeled this series the gospel journey because Paul is on a gospel journey and the Thessalonians are on a gospel journey and so are we as well. So it's, it's fitting for the gospel journey to be the title of this. We're going to read yeah, the first five verses of chapter 3. And we're going to focus on the last phrase in that paragraph. So if you can pick up your version of Scripture. If you don't have one, please help yourself to the one there sitting in the pew. And our bulletin is made so you can take notes. Uh, and if you don't own a Bible and you want to own one, come talk to me. I have Bibles I can give to you. Uh, no, they're not as cool as this one, but the, the, in, the inside is the same. So, um, and I'll take you to go buy one. All right. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker, in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass and just As you know, for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word of God. We thank you for your character that is never changing. Father, we thank you for your very near presence in our life. Father, as we examine scriptures and as we go through the word of God this morning, help us to be aware and to look to see ourselves in the text. Help us to look to see who you are in the text and help us to walk away changed into the image of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. We commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so look at verses 1 through 5 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Actually, visually take a look at this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question based off of these first five verses. What do you feel, what do you feel is the major ideas in this, this paragraph? What, what are the major things that, that Paul talks about here in this passage? And I'm actually going to ask you to raise your hand and answer. What, what, would be, what would be just a couple of things, big ideas, that's in this first paragraph of chapter 3? Anyone want to just, and I'm not looking for big, long sentences, just something short. Yeah, go ahead. Say it out loud, though, because you're all the way in the back. What? Okay, so Timothy went to establish and to exhort. The Thessalonians, right? What else? Well, what's, another, what's another big idea that we see? Why did Timothy write what he did? Yes. Okay, yeah, I mean, to the point to where he was like, we could not stand it anymore. We couldn't go another day. We had to find out what was going on with you. Okay, even to the point where he said, it was okay to leave me alone in Athens, which was a big deal. I think, one, because their life was constantly being threatened, Right? And then number two, probably Paul had some type of ailment that really did, rest- he needed a team of people around him. Okay, what else? Did someone else raise your hand? Go ahead. Say it real loud, but you got to say it to them. Persecution. Okay. That's yeah, so, so, yeah, that's a huge, I mean, like right here, he, he, Paul is saying, we told you that persecution is going to, it's the norm for us. If you're on a gospel journey and you live amongst Jews and you're living amongst Romans, and you live amongst Greeks, persecution is going to come. And this isn't any surprise. It 
It came to us and it's going to come to you. So, so that was a big thing. And then finally, the last thought that we see here, and this is, he's talked about Satan hindering them before. So if you look at verse, like I think it's 17 of chapter 2, uh, 17 of chapter 2, but since we are torn away from you, brothers, for a short time in person, not in heart, we endeavor the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. Uh, and then verse 18, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. And the word that, and that the idea is here is that he knows how to put trenches and obstacles and blow up bridges to hinder you from moving forward. It's a strategic military uh, plan to stop the forward movement of someone's enemy. And that's what Satan was doing. And so now he revisits that a little bit differently, and and that's what we're going to spend time. So we look at verse 5. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. So when you think about temptation, what does that mean? And, and I think I think if I think we can talk we can talk a lot about temptation. I don't, I don't think that's a, a, I don't think that's a term that we're unfamiliar with. We know what it, we know what it means to be tempted. We know what it means to submit to temptation, to be lured away and enticed. So is temptation a good thing or a bad thing? Right. I want you to, th- to think about the word, because uh, what's another word for temptation? What's another word for temptation? To be tested, right? Have you heard that before? Temptation and to be tested. Now, that word tested could be good and could be bad. And r- real briefly, we're going we're gonna to look at that. So there, there's two connotations of the word testing, the first Greek word is dokimon. No, let me say that again. Dokimion. There we go. Dokimion. I had to do the parsed out phrase. There. Okay. Dokimion. It's a metallurgist term for testing the genuineness of something by fire. And you probably have heard this, but it, the fire reveals true metal by extreme heat and the impurities are, are, are float to the top and you're able to wipe away the dross and you have a true and genuine metal. It's, the, it's a powerful term for the positive process of testing. And I say positive because its end result is to affirm or to accept something. Testing in this sense is a positive experience. Yes, it may be difficult to go through, but the end result is genuineness. The end result is worthwhile. It's good. It's valuable. It's honored. <clears throat> if you look at James chapter 1, verse 3, I'm going to put it up on the screen here. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And in this sense, it is a good thing. James is a very interesting book when we're talking about temptation and being tested. In the first chapter, okay, and, and I, I think I've talked to you about blueletterbible.org. Does anyone remember me talking to you about blueletterbible.org? Okay, this is a Bible study, a free online Bible program that takes, you can do it any translation. You can do King James, New King James, NASB, NIV, ESV. Find your translation And what happens is it breaks down the verses, and beside it, there's this little button called tools that you hit. And when you do that, it reveals a number of Bible study tools. One of those is a Strong's Concordance system. And what that does, that Strong's Concordance breaks down each single Greek word, and it says specifically what this Greek word is, and it'll give you other places in the Bible that that same Greek word is used so you can understand it. And so, and so when you do that through James, it uses not only the dokimon word, but it also uses the second word that we're going to talk about. 
So this first one, the term conveys the idea of someone examined and proved to be genuine. The second Greek term is pyrosmos. 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 I feel like I'm playing, uh, what's that game that we play? Mad Gab. No, it's not it. Okay, so pyrosmos. Pyrosmos. This term has the connotation of examination for the purpose of finding fault or rejection. This is the negative understanding of this word. This is the word that was used in relation to the temptation of Jesus that we find in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 says this, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Satan was attempting to trap Jesus. Satan was attempting to to, uh, find fault in Jesus. Matthew chapter 16, verse 1, And the Pharisees and the Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. What do you think the motivation was of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? To prove that he was right? Yay, Jesus! Or to trap him and to discredit him. They tried to trap him. Here we see in Hebrews, go ahead and bring that next one up from Hebrews. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. For because he himself has been suffered when he was lured to be trapped, he is able to help those who are being lured to be trapped. Does that make sense? These are the differences of the words. Jesus commands not to test God in this way. Not to try to tempt God. The Lord. He says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 7, Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. It can't happen. James verse 1 and thir- or ver- or chapter 1, verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. What does that mean? God isn't trying to destroy you. God's not trying to trap you. On the contrary, God loves you. And through His Son, Jesus Christ provides every way for us to be in a right, restored, redeemed relationship with Him. Every good gift comes from above. So, what is, so what's going on here in Thessalonica? What's going on with the Thessalonians? See, here, here's what Paul is doing. The condition of the believer's faith burdened Paul's heart. There was a heavy weight on Paul because of the circumstances, because of the hastiness of his short time that was there and having to leave. They were just babes in Christ. And his heart was burdened. Were they still trusting in God? Or had they abandoned him and returned to paganism? See, Paul wasn't concerned that they lost their salvation. That wasn't his concern. Because they couldn't do that. You you, you physically can't work yourself out of salvation. You can't do that. How do I know that? Because you didn't work yourself into salvation. You don't earn salvation, therefore you can't unearn salvation. Is that even a word? I don't know. You can't do that. Well, how do I know that's true? Look at verse 
uh, chapter 1 of verse 4. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. You didn't do anything. God chose believers. God chose his children. They could, however, cease to walk by faith, to fall into a hole, to be trapped, not trusting God in all circumstances of life. This, Satan is good at this, this can stunt your growth. As a pastor, and I know some of you would be able to sympathize with me, but not seeing someone flourish in Christ is a painful thing to watch. Seeing someone trust Christ, but then to just see them flounder and to be tossed this way and that way, and for their faith to just not flourish, is a very painful thing to watch. Paul says it this way in uh, verse 5, that our coming to you would be in vain, that our labor would be in vain. Paul saw Satan using their persecution. You nailed that. Paul saw Satan using their persecution, the the, the weight of the circumstances and the severity of the resistance to grow in Christ, to lure them away from knowing and trusting in the will of God. Satan will snatch away or stunt the gospel journey in their life. That's the work. Of Satan. That's the work of the tempter. Let, let, let's reinforce this a little bit. Go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. I am ex- I'm taking one class at Summit University or Bible Baptist. What's it called? Baptist Bible of uh, St. Clark Summit. I don't even know what the name is now. Um. And I'm taking on New Testament literature. It's, it's amazing. We're going through the Gospels right now, and, but I'll save you from that. Okay, Luke chapter 8, and we're going to turn to verses 11 through 15. This is the parable of the sower, and I'm going to read it. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature." As for the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold, hold it fast and honest and good heart and bear fruit and patience. Let's jump up to verse 4. And when the great crowd was gathering from people from town after town, a sower went out to sow the seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up, and it choked it. Some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As said these things, he called out, Who has ears to hear, let them hear. I believe in this parable that Jesus is teaching that some make professions of faith and begin to show signs of growth, but the hard or the heat of trials or the more subtle thorns of worldly desires Cause the plants to die and to perish. And I believe that's what Paul was worried about here with Thessalonians. He was, belie- he was worried that they were going to get choked out. So let me state the obvious this morning. 
If you haven't written anything down, this is what you're going to write down, okay? Write this down. You will not make it as a Christian if you do not learn to overcome temptation. Amen, Pastor. Right? I'm going to say it one more time. You will not grow if you do not learn to overcome temptation. You'll get choked out. Does it mean you lose your salvation? No, it doesn't. Does it mean that you will not flourish? Absolutely. The devil's main objective is to stop people from believing. He does not want followers of Christ. And when that fails, his next aim is to destroy your faith. If he can't stop you from believing, he wants to stop you from growing. From knowing Christ, growing in your relationship with Christ, and then the ultimate fruit is showing others how they can know Christ and grow in Christ and show others how they can know Christ and grow Christ. Satan wants to destroy your gospel journey. He wants to set up a hole and for you to fall into it and not be able to get out. He wants to blow the bridge up so you cannot move forward. That is what the tempter means to do when he throws temptation at you. Well, how? How does he do this? Intellectual arguments that cause us to doubt the Bible and God, to ridicule and verbal abuse, to shame us, to turn us from Christ, tempt us into sin and to lock you up habitually that you will destroy your own life through these vices. Force you to declare that God has abandoned you. Well, if God loves me, why am I going through all this? Why doesn't he just take it away? True faith understands persecution, understands deception. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your love, your strength, and the ability to resist temptation. There are some of you that are sitting in here and you're so locked up into habitual sin that you think there is no way out. And let me tell you, Jesus says there is a way out. And I can free you from that sin. Turn to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. This is an interesting companion to our passage of Scripture. We're making good time. All right, Genesis chapter 3. Yeah, I'm well past the intro. Don't worry. Just in case you were worried about that. They're like, I know you, Pastor Mike. You were just warming up. No, we're almost done. (laughs) All right. We're going into our second passage. All right. So Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 7, because I think it's here that we're going to find out how temptation works. The first instance. This is it. This This is the pattern. This is where we see it all begin. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty. Oh, what an interesting term that one is. The serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say to you, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Verse 4, But when the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. 
For God knows when you will eat of it, and your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of the both were open, and they knew what, that they were naked, And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Parents, if you're in here this morning, this is this is this is good stuff here. You you should you should know how where this passage is and strategize within your life to walk your children through the strategy of temptation. What is temptation and how will it overcome you? Here is a model that you can say, son, daughter, beware of this right here. This is going to seemingly come at you at every corner in life, temptation. So how does temptation work? Number one, Satan is crafty and deceptive. Crafty means shrewd. Shrewd is actually a, uh, a word in the Old Testament that is a good trait to have. But crafty means shrewd. Satan uses his shrewd knowledge about life to deceive and to trap us. The elegant serpent. Remember, when he's talking about the serpent, we're not talking about like, ooh, boa constrictor. It's like an elegant animal that was good to look at. The elegant serpent waited until she was alone. And we need to take note of that. Are you taking notes? Okay, temptation is most powerful when you are, say it with me, alone. Is that true? Amen, pastor, it is. Temptation is most powerful when you're alone. Live with the mind to please God even when you are alone. This is what you need to pray for. God, help me love you at all times especially when I am alone because I believe your presence is very near to me. Temptation is usually deceptive. Satan makes it look like sin will get you where you want to go right now. It will meet your needs. And so why deny yourself? Satan is crafty and deceptive. Number two, Satan challenges the word of God. Satan challenges the word of God. You'll see here in verse one. Now a serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to woman, did God actually say? Undermining the authority of scripture. And he will challenge the word of God. This is a big red flag. If something you are facing is challenging the word of God, you should take the warning signs and stop. If something that you're doing clicks and says, well, I don't think I, uh, the word, probably a no-no, right? Look at the serpent re-explaining or reinterpreting the word of God in verses 4 and 5. You look here in verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of your eyes will be open, you will be like God, knowing good or evil. He is trying to reinterpret scripture, to re-explain it. When I talk to young couples madly in love, right, premarital counseling, and we talk about premarital sex. Sometimes you hear this. Well, is intercourse really wrong before marriage? I mean, we're madly in love. What's the difference between a month from now, after we have put the rings on the fingers, and where we're at today? Surely nothing's going to go wrong between then and now. Oh, foolish ones. <laughs> It's a big deal. That wedding day, the day we make a promise, the day that we 
solidify that promise with a ring, it's a big deal. There's a huge difference between engagement and marriage. Right? Oh, I just totally thought of a joke, but I didn't say it because it would not be good. All right. See, that's Satan's thing. He tempts you by being deceptive and challenging the word of God. Number three, Satan downplays God's character. Well, God is too harsh. Oh, he surely, oh, he's, he doesn't really mean that. God's a cosmic killjoy. He just doesn't want you to have fun. Satan's a good liar. And he says, you surely shall not die. See, I think that's what we need to be on guard on when we're suffering, right? When we're going through that testing or those trials or those landmines or when the bridge is out or when physically overwhelming odds against us, that is when we need to put our guard on because that's the time that we're most susceptible to temptation, isn't it? When your body and your mind and your emotions and you feel alone, when all those things come at you, that's when you are the most prime to be devoured by Satan and the evil one. When you're suffering, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. Here's the last thing. Satan does not want you to think about the certainty of God's judgment, and he certainly doesn't want to talk about the pain that sin and habitual sin will have over your life. He doesn't talk about that here. He doesn't talk about the most catastrophic event of all mankind, the fall of man, the Garden of Eden shut. Uh, I mean, if you think about these, this couple... Right? If you think about it, immediately their sin was made real. They felt embarrassed to be next to each other. Eventually, they were even alienated from one another because of sin. Their firstborn son killed his brother. He didn't talk about any of that. He just said, your eyes will be open to good and evil. la di da It's just some fruit. The human race has been maimed by the tragedy of sin ever since that date. And we feel it in our bodies. We see it in our families. We know it's true. But God has a redemption plan. Jesus and his work on the cross allowing us to live on the victory side. Real quick. Here's a strategy to overcome temptation. And I know, listen, this isn't an exhaustive lesson on temptation. There's so much more that we can go here. But I wanted to take the context of what Paul was thinking when he talked about the tempter tempting you. And at the very foundation, we see this in uh, Genesis. I think we need to start here. There's, we, we can talk more about temptation and uh, that In more detail, we're just not, because I think we need to go through the foundation. Number one, write this down, a strategy to overcome temptation. Number one, beware of new twists of doctrine. Beware of the twists of doctrine that people have a tendency to do. Because it's a slow fade and it will trap you sometimes. It's re-explaining scripture. Ah, well, that's pretty offensive. I don't want people to hear through that. So we're going to make it nice. So everybody feels comfortable with it. We can't do that. We can't water down truth. We can't get sucked into pluralism. My way, your way, ah, that's all okay. It's a lie. Number two, we need to affirm God's word. Draw hard lines. Don't be afraid to bring up God in your life. 
Don't be afraid to bring up God with people who are struggling. Listen, odd is odd. Listen, when people are going through things, they, they can't hide it all. And typically, when, when you spend time with someone, you see something's off, it's probably off for a reason. Odd is odd. And I have always leaned on, if something doesn't seem right, it's probably because something isn't. And I pry. Hey, how are you doing? Good, good, good. Yeah, great. No, seriously, how are you doing? Oh, good, good, good. Really? Because your whole face and demeanor looks like there's something going on. Good, good. I'm struggling. Okay, now we're getting to it, all right? Well, what if they don't agree with me? Suck it up. Learn how to have a debate. Learn how to have a conversation without freaking out and crying. Well, okay, a little crying is okay. Pray for them like crazy, but keep at it. Ministry is a, I heard this recently, ministry is a crock pot. It takes a long time. It's not a rocket launch. Bring God up. Number three, affirm God's character. It's so important to know how to get into God's word and look for his character for encouragement and strength during hard times. It's so important to be able to learn, know how to do that. When you're struggling, you need to know how to open up the Bible. Okay, God, I'm blubbering, right? Got the big tears, the ugly girl cry, okay? You know what I'm talking about, mascara running, okay? So you get that, okay, open up the Word of God. Okay, God, where, where do I need to go? Well, I don't know where to go. Well, pick somewhere. And this is where the community of faith really needs to step in. The body of Christ. Church, if a brother or sister in faith is failing, struggling, don't be afraid to stop by their house. Don't be afraid to send them a text that has a verse of Scripture mapped out on it. It takes three texts to cover it, okay? Don't be afraid to text them verses, that to message them prayers, to call them up and to affirm the character of God. Don't be afraid to do that. Because I know it's true, and I've visited people that say this, sometimes I don't even feel like opening the word. Well, let me do it with you. Right? Amen? Amen. We must affirm the reality of sin, God's judgment, And we must remember that sin gives fleeting pleasure, but results in pain far worse and far longer. It's like living on credit cards, right? Living on credit cards. Sure, it's fun for a while, but guess what? One day, you need to do what? You got to pay up, sucker, right? Yeah, you can live on credit cards, but trust me, after the honeymoon's over... It's bill time, and you got to pay them off. That's like sin is like, it's fun for a bit, but you got to pay up. And that's what hurts. And that's what Satan tries to do to hold you down, to hold you back, to destroy your faith, and to make sure that you don't flourish in Jesus. That's the point of temptation. And because of that, we need to resist temptation. And we need to stand against Satan. And as a church body, we need to surround one another because when someone's failing and when they're strong, you've got to help them pick up. Well, it's their life. You know, it's real personal. It's between them and God. Get involved in their life and save them. Save them from the trap of sin and the pain that that sin is holding on to them because they're not growing. They're struggling. Amen? So that's why Paul wrote the Thessalonians and he sent Timothy back. He was afraid that the tempter was tempting. Let's stand up. Let's pray. I'm going to ask you to just bow bow your heads, close your eyes, do some business with God. 
hey, gang, I get it. I get that we're in a public place and we live our life and we're all struggling. But if we can't do business here, if we can't know how to hear the word and to walk away changed here at church when we open up the word of God, where can we do it? This is just, this is just the place that we practice it and we get used to it and we get the encouragement. Because when we leave here, we're going to be put to the test, right? Right?